Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Precisionary webinar this morning. Um, it is September 26th. We're joining everybody at 10 a.m. Eastern time. And we are here to welcome Dr. Josh Snyder from Duke. Um, he is going to talk today on techniques his lab has developed for three-dimensional lineage tracing during tumorogenesis. Um, so Dr. Snyder leads the Cancer Initiation and Cancer Cell Behavior Lab at Duke. His research mission is to unravel the mysteries of how cancer cells adapt and then thrive in the crucial pre-diagnosis phase. And additionally, his lab plays a pivotal role in the Center for Applied Therapeutics, where their cutting edge models are shared as invaluable tools for preclinical and translational research. And now at the heart of their work lies a profound fascination with the earliest stages of tumorogenesis, where cancer cells in their ecosystems begin to adapt and give rise to what are then aggressive metastatic cancers. So Dr. Snyder's lab uses the innovative cancer rainbow mouse models or rainbow and hyperspectral techniques. And using these methods, they explore tumor initiation really with unprecedented spatial and temporal resolution. So with that, I wanna hand it over to Dr. Snyder who is gonna give our talk today. And real quick for everybody, um, please feel free to use the chat box to add uh, comments and ask questions. And at the end of Dr. Snyder's talk, we will open up the floor and you're absolutely free and welcome to um, uh, ask questions in person at our talk. Thank you so much. Dr. Snyder, handing it over to you. Yep. Thank you very much. Looks like we have one more in the waiting room. Do you let that person in or is, do I do that? I got, got it. Got it. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Abby, for the uh, very kind words and kind introduction. Um, yeah, it's really wonderful to be able to speak with you all today and really just, I think, broadly paint a picture of uh, what my lab is doing in this space of uh, tumor initiation and progression and how we are using, um, you know, really tried and true lineage tracing technologies and pairing those with imaging techniques and cancer biology techniques to really get at the question of uh, where cancer cells initiate within an organ, uh, how how clones of, of cancer cells may actually be competing or maybe even sometimes cooperating with one another, and then being able to trace this and follow these early events and help us to better understand what makes a lethal metastasis, uh, a lethal metastasis at its initiation. And so here's a just kind of an image I'm showing you from uh, one of our favorite mouse models we published on a, a couple of years back in which we can express various isoforms of the human oncogene HER2 and then co-express those oncogenes with fluorescent proteins that we can image and then use as somewhat like a, a fluorescent barcode. And that enables us to scan and then actually visualize uh, somatic clones and uh, mutational uh, mutant cells within, within the duct. And so this is a picture of the, of the mammary gland and you can see if I, let's see here, if I get my laser pointer going here, you, you can see kind of this nice ductal tree that is present within the mammary gland, but already you can see these different colored patches present within the duct. Uh, some of them are still within the duct, others that are starting to grow into these kind of uh, um, proliferative lesions pushing out against the fat pad. And so really this is a, a very early clue as to what could be going on uh, during this initiation phase, in this case of breast cancer. Uh, we've also published on the use of these uh, models to look at lineage tracing somatic mutations in the intestine. This is a paper we published in 2019. Uh, on the left are three different oncogenes of beta-catenin. On the right is a, a oncogenic, uh, three different onco oncogenic forms of our spondin. And you can see the massive differences just in morphology that these oncogenes have and impact within, uh, within the intestinal epithelium. This is in small intestine uh, in both of these cases. And really then the question becomes with these barcodes, can we start to, in fluorescent barcodes, can we start to make conclusions about cell dynamics and cell behavior and cell, cell fitness within the intestine? Uh, and you know, I'll show you how we're doing some of that here in, in a few slides. And so really, um, I think the overview of my talk, and I'm going to try to keep it as broad as possible because I know there might be many different disciplines here today is to give an introduction on a little bit of cancer philosophy, 
what what, did it, what is the multi-step model? What what do we mean by that? How how do we why do we want to study this process? Uh, what is a field cancer? So what is this kind of field of epithelial cells that may have mutant cells and, and precancerous characteristics? And then I'll shift gears a little into the use of our, our cancer rainbow technology, where we, where we, in essence, as, as what I just showed you in the last two slides, how we can light up oncogenes within an epithelium, and then be able to trace the cell types in the uh, the, the cells spreading within an epithelium, and then eventually becoming a uh, metastatic cancer. Uh, I'll focus on two models. One briefly in the intestine, the second one that we we have a significant amount of work building in HER2, and then I'll leave you with a few future directions. So an introduction really to just cancer philosophy, uh, you know, it's been known for a very long time, or I should say theorized for a very long time, that, uh, you know, cancers form out of this iterative stepwise accumulation of mutant of mutations to the genome. And this theory was really put forth in, in the early 50s by early 50s by Nordling and Armitage, where they really tried to establish, uh, in essence, mathematical models for why it is do, that we primarily get cancer in old age. And the idea was that it must be the, the end result, as it's put here in this paper, of several rounds of mutations or cellular changes that increase and kind of collect as we age. And so this really led to, you know, the, um, you know, the multi-stage model of cancer that was really well documented by Bert Vogelstein's group. And I think really nicely reviewed here in this seminal paper in 2013 called Cancer Genome Landscapes. And really, it really starts to establish kind of a stepwise process by which a, a normal healthy epithelium, in this case, the colonic epithelium, could uh, um, uh, be hit with a mutation like APC that leads to a small adenoma. And then subsequent rounds of mutations uh, result in iterative changes in these cells' phenotypes and uh, how they interact with their microenvironment that are eventually given time and chance and several rounds of mutations could lead <clears throat> to these invasive and highly aggressive carcinomas. And my lab is really interested in operating in this space here at the far left. So if we look at this histology of the colonic epithelium, is it really normal, right? And what we're beginning to appreciate is that there are clone, clonal uh, uh, um, fields that are actually seeding and spreading throughout this colon where there are somatic mutations that are occurring, but they're absent to any pathology. And we think that this earliest phase uh, uh, before you have pathology is quite important and we need to be able to study it. I think that this is a really a pain cancer problem. I'm showing you another picture here from this excellent review from uh, uh, Navin in 2016. And uh, what, what is portrayed here is, is similar to the uh, kind of the sequential progression story I just showed you in the last slide. Uh, it has been applied to breast cancer. So the breast can uh, the, the mammary gland is made up of a normal duct epithelium. Uh, that is uh, throughout the fat pad of the organ. Uh, these epithelial, this epithelium can be really cartooned as a luminal epithelium on the inside of the duct and surrounded by a myoepithelium or basal cell layer on the outside. It's thought that mutations within these luminal cells uh, can lead to hyperplasia, eventually atypical hyperplasia. Maybe subsequent mutations occur that lead to this early stage cancer called DCIS. And eventually uh, uh, these DCIS lesions may, may progress to an invasive ductal carcinoma. So this is again, this, this very linear and stepwise kind of methodical progression from a, a normal uh, looking epithelium all the way out to invasive cancer. And again, we're curious in my lab, what is occurring very early? in between this normal duct and ductal hyperplasia view. And then what is occurring there? How do we analyze that time point? Uh, and what happens during that time point? Th does it actually predict what could what the uh, trajectory of the disease, disease could look like actually maybe many years later? And so this leads us to a really interesting study um, uh, 
presented by Ian McDonald in 1951. Ian McDonald was a, a, a kind of an infamous, if you will, uh, surgical pathologist of the uh, 1950s for his views on what he called biological predeterminism. And it was actually a really interesting study in which what he did is he, he took uh, uh, women who had um, uh, undergone self-examination to detect any abnormalities in the breast. And he asked the question, what was the latency with which it took that person to that woman to go from a um, uh, self exam to the clinic? And so in this case, he's charting here. Uh, it took about two thirds of a month once a self diagnose self examination had occurred to uh, making it to the clinic. And then he graded these cancers as either stage one or stage two. Stage one being local disease. Stage two being invasion to the lymph node. And what he found is about 40% of these cancers were diagnosable as stage one and 60% were stage two. And, you know, one hypothesis might be is that the longer you wait to go to the clinic, the, the worse the cancer may become. But what he, he was actually astonished when he found that really, you know, it's not until you get to 18 months or so of delay that you start to see this really, this, this increase and actually fairly modest increase in upstaging to stage two. So he quipped that what's actually going on here is that the 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 balance between the the, the tumor and the host uh, has been established well before even self examination or clinical diagnosis of the disease. So much so that what happened early in that process has almost uh, established a trajectory of the disease, and that could be one towards more uh, metastatic disease, such as this the stage two diagnosis. Uh, and he went on to kind of. Uh, provide a guess as to how long this process could be going on. And he predicted that this kind of invisible phase or this occult phase, the one that we cannot see, might be as lengthy as eight years long. And so, you know, um, this just goes to show you, you know, potentially uh, the provocative uh, um, conclusions that you can draw from this. And what he, what he did is he, he charted the increased incidence of breast cancer that was found by self-examination. And what he found was that there was actually no decrease in mortality. So this is quite striking, suggesting again that this, even detecting a little bit earlier, wasn't really establishing a remarkable reduction in mortality. Um, maybe because again, what happened early in this very lengthy pre-diagnostic phase was really establishing these lethal cancers quite early. And you see a similar chart uh, provided by in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2016, showing that, again, this increase in early stage cancers diagnosed in this case uh, by uh, mammogram have not really led to a remarkable or you could say a, a, a concordant or dramatic decrease in metastatic breast cancer cases. And we actually know that many of these metastatic breast cancer cases may actually be metastatic many years uh, before um, uh, primary cancers are diagnosed. And so uh, this leads us to uh, really the application of our cancer rainbow mouse models, because I'm showing you a picture here of the pancreas in which we're lighting up the pancreas with various fluorescent proteins and various oncogenes. And what this gives us the ability to do in the mouse is actually study this, this invisible phase of cancer, because what we can do is we can turn on an oncogene that drives a transform transformative event in the epithelium and then use imaging to trace the effects that it has on each cell as an individual cell or as a collective group of clones of cells. And so uh, here I'll, I'll show you how, how we do this. So what we do is we engineer into the mouse uh, a transgene, and we target this transgene to an area of the genome called the Rosa locus. Uh, the Rosa locus was chosen because this gives us a, a, a really easy way to, because uh, there's a lot of reagents to target that locus, really easy way to manipulate the genome and insert into that area uh, any transgene. In addition, the Rosa locus is also um, uh, in an area of euchromatin, so it is permissive for expression in most cell types within the mouse. So our transgene looks like this. It's really a modification of kind of the original Brainbow systems first developed by Jean Levet and uh, Joshua Sain's group. And what we do is we knock in to the Rosa locus a transgene that expresses a ubiquitous promoter called the CAG, such that anything downstream of this promoter will be highly expressed in all cells. 
we express one of four, or excuse me, we express first a fluorescent protein with a stop signal. So at steady state, every cell in these mice express an infrared fluorescent protein called a FAP. But when we cross this mouse to any mouse expressing a Cree recombinase, uh, the Cree recombinase can act upon these um, orthogonal lock sites, like LOX P, LOX2272, and LOX N. And when Cree recombinase acts upon these lock sites, since they are nested and in the same direction, we can get uh, deletion of DNA uh, fragments or cassettes in which case we could have deletion of the FAP and then we'll get juxtaposition of, in this case, what's called XFP1 or deletion of both of these cassettes and juxtaposition of XFP2 and so on and so forth to XFP3. These XFPs are fluorescent proteins that we had chosen uh, to be uh, really spectrally uh, uh, distinct from one another so that we could use really any uh, fairly standard fluorescent imaging approach to color separate these fluorescent proteins. Uh, these fluorescent proteins are also targeted to the nucleus, making it, our lives a little bit easier as we analyze data uh, because nuclei are so easy to segment. Uh, so we, we use that to our advantage to count cells. And then in addition, these fluorescent proteins uh, at their three prime, at the uh, three prime end of the message, express a 2A uh, a peptide. And what this 2A peptide enables is really expression of two different two different proteins from the same mRNA. So that gives us the ability to express not only a teal fluorescent protein, a yellow fluorescent protein, or magenta fluorescent protein, but a oncogene co-expressed with those proteins. So in this game, what you can do is you can take any number of our cancer rainbow mouse models, you can cross it to a Cree recombinase, and your epithelium will go from this non-fluorescent state to a fluorescent state. And we know, based upon the model we're using, each fluorescent color tells us which uh, oncogene is actually expressed in that cell. So then we can play an actually a, a very simple game where we add Cree, image, and then we can image over time and establish you know, some really interesting uh, observations, look at some really interesting uh, time points in the early tumorigenic cascade. Some really great benefits to our model is that it is immune intact. Uh, it really enables us to encode in a reliable and kind of a reductionist view based strategy, uh, genetic heterogeneity. And uh, many of our models encode human oncogenes, so that makes it really nice for testing any therapies that might be available or being used in the clinic. So what we did first is we, we wanted to establish this model uh, in, uh, in a rigorous way. And so we went first to the intestine because uh, the intestine classically has such a well-described stem cell hierarchy. And this is a, a nature review uh, from Nick Barker and really just showing kind of the overall, you know, gross anatomy of the small intestine and the colon. Um, uh, you know, really what's uh, similar between the two is the, is the presence of these stem cells that reside at the very base, in this case, of the small intestinal crypt and stem cells residing at the very base of the colonic crypts. Uh, these stem cells express the gene called LGR5. And we, we know from, you know, uh, much of the work from Hans Klevers and Doug Witten's group that these LGR5 stem cells uh, proliferate almost daily and give rise to all the uh, differentiated cell types of both the small intestinal epithelium and the, and the, and the large intestine. Uh, the, the, the epithelium in the intestine is quite unique because it replaces in essence once every week. And so it gives us this really great way to, you know, turn on our fluorescent uh, reporters in the intestinal stem cell and then watch the clonal expansion of these oncogene expressing cells occur uh, throughout the epithelium. And really the, the big question we had is if we have this collection of stem cells at the base of the crypt, I'm showing you kind of a cross section here, what would happen if we gave these cells an oncogenic mutation? We knew from pri prior literature that these mutations could actually, you know, kind of uh, uh, outcompete the uh, stem cells within, within the area and, and become this orange clone of stem cells at the base of the crypt. But it was really unclear to us as to how these crypt cells could then spread laterally from one crypt to the next. And so we really wanted to understand the impact of kind of the drift of these mutations throughout each crypt as a unit, and then their um, 
they're 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 spread laterally, if you will, throughout the epithelium. And so this is where you know our work began on some of these models. This was in 2019 where we first published on this uh, cancer rainbow mouse model. And you know some of our initial experiments were really deal dealt with dialing in the levels of oncogenic or dominant negative forms of beta catenin so that we could provide increased you know oncogenic forms like this one in ye yellow and show that these these mutant fields spread more quickly in, in the uh, mutant forms the mutant uh, beta catenin, whereas knocking down this classical signaling pathway could actually uh, kind of reverse these effects. And so this was just kind of a first pass view of the data and, and the technology. Um, but really what be, what was surprising to us is, you know, as these mice aged, these field or patches really remained quite stagnant. And so they were kind of landlocked, if you will. So these yellow crypts really had nowhere to go because they were sitting next door and adjacent to blue crypts. Question was how could these cells escape and, and and establish crypts in new places and help this field of cells spread throughout the epithelium? And so we, we had known for some time and it had been published on uh, um, this that there 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 are mutations in our spondin or, or fusion mutations in our spondin that had been previously published on, and so we had found that you know. Uh, using an RNA fish against our spondin, that our spondin was primarily expressed in in cells subtending both the small intestinal crypt and the colonic crypts. And so what we did next is we said, well, what if we made a, a new form of cancer rainbow mice where we express, again, our fluorescent barcodes, but now forms of our spondin like wild type or even these mutant forms, these fusion forms that had been described. And what we found when we did that is that uh, unlike in panel D here, where we could see the, the, the normal view of the crypts that where they all become a single color of cells, we could start to see these crypts become quite heterogeneous uh, and, and multicolored and, and polyclonal. And what was striking is uh, the speed at which once these cells were recombined, they could actually start mixing and migrating throughout the epithelium, unlike uh, the previous case with beta catenin. And uh, what we did, what we had to do, which was really difficult, is we needed to get uh, large uh, uh, sections, thick sections of intestine, and that had previously been quite challenging. And it's one of the the uh, uses that we had for the uh, uh, the compressed tome is that we took the intestines, uh, we auger embedded them, and uh, we were able to get actually pretty nice thick slices of the intestine, and that enabled us to, you know. Uh, capture 3D images with a confocal uh, for for the um, uh, the Cranbo barcodes, and then be able to look at not only kind of the mixed heterogeneity present day three after recombination, but then be able to follow that out through eight weeks. And so that enabled us really to to start to to look at and calculate the speed with which once a malignant cell, uh, not malignant, but once a uh, um, oncogene expressing cell forms in the intestine, how quickly it could form into these patches and, and tracks of cells that really invade and take over most of the epithelium within eight weeks. And so that was really kind of the, uh, um, the, the first use case for our technology. Uh, but then we, we ultimately had wanted and desired to get into um, some uh the the her2 space in, in the breast and so we used um our insight and in, in some of the knowledge that we had gained up until this point to design and develop a her2 model of uh treatment resistant and metastatic breast cancer and one of the challenges that we observed was that um her2 positive breast cancer um was you know classically one of the worst prog noses you could receive. Uh, but then the advent of uh, these wonderful targeted therapies like um, monoclonal antibodies against HER2 or tyrosine kinase inhibitors has really revolutionized the care for HER2 positive breast cancer patients. But even so, those patients that either progress to metastasis or might be diagnosed at or might be de novo diagnosed as stage four metastases, you can see the overall survival is quite low. 
uh, only about four and a half years to 50% overall survival and progression to free survival is quite low as well. So we wanted to understand, you know, um, what could be causing this treatment resistant HER2 positive breast cancer in patients. And we wanted to be able to study that uh, very early in the process. So we knew, uh, based upon really wonderful work, uh, you know, now now decades old, that you know many models of HER2 positive breast cancer have been developed in the mouse. But what was interesting is that uh, the wild type HER2 shown here in green. If you overexpress wild type HER2, you can see the latency with which it takes these tumors to actually develop, almost 200 days, to reach 50% uh, tumor burden. That's compared to the line on the left uh, when you have a point mutation in, in HER2. So the question has really become, well, HER2 itself is overexpressed in breast cancers, but is HER2, wild type HER2 it's, itself a driver gene, or do you need uh, all alternative isoforms or mutations to the receptor for this to occur? And so over the course of many years, it was really discovered that uh, a form of HER2 called the exon 16 splice isoform, it could actually be identified. And this form of HER2 lacks uh, uh, 16 amino acids uh, that are encoded by exon 16. It's in essence a splice null isoform. And this results in a, a form of the receptor that homodimerizes and, and signals extensively. A, a second form, another form of the receptor, and this is just a few of them, uh, is called the P95 isoform. And this isoform is interesting because of its ability to be cleaved. And so you can see here that most of the end terminus is actually cleaved. And this can occur um, either through alternative start sites, or as this study suggests that when you knock down atom 10, you can reduce this cleavage. So it can also be potentially induced through cleavage of the end terminus. And you know, clearly the lack of the end terminus would mean that this would have no epitope for uh, uh, to be bound by antibody therapy like trastuzumab. And there's also some indications uh, that there could be differences in um, uh, treatment in the Delta-16 isoform. So we really wanted to know what would happen if we could genetically encode HER2 heterogeneity within the mammary gland? Could we visualize the effects that it may have on tumor genesis, uh, use these mice to test therapies, and to really look at how HER2-positive breast cancer initiates within the mammary gland. So we returned to our model. Uh, in this case, we engineered a mouse model that we'd call HER2-Crambo. Here's our, our Crambo construct again, where we have the ubiquitous, ubiquitous CAG promoter, driving expression of FAP, this fluorescent infrared fluorescent uh, protein, and then our TFP, YFP, MKO fluorescent protein barcodes, pseudo-colored again in cyan, yellow, and magenta. In this case, each of our fluorescent proteins is co-expressed with either human wild type HER2, human Delta-16 HER2, or human P95 HER2. We add, uh, we cross this mouse to a mouse expressing uh, the, mam uh, the mammary tumor virus, mouse mammary tumor virus Cree expressing uh, mouse line. So this is MMTB Cree. Uh, and this induces recombination in uh, the luminal epithelium within the mammary gland. We take these glands, we uh, perform clarification of the tissue so we can image uh, in 3D and image throughout the tissue. And then we can uh, really trace uh, the, the clonal initiation of HER2-positive breast cancer, as we show here. So, first of all, we looked. We can look very early now. So, two weeks or so after recombination, as the gland is developing, uh, we can start to already uh, look at differences in uh, each isoform's expression pattern as it relates to the morphology of the gland. So, again, this is just two weeks after oncogene expression. And this is about 12 to 14 weeks before we will see uh, palpable tumors emerge in these mice. So it really gives us this great insight in the very early process of the tumor, tumorigenic cascade. And already we can see differences in uh, uh, how these cells are kind of aggregating together. Uh, we see that the, uh, the yellow Delta-16 expressing cells 
are uh, already forming these in interesting looking bud-like structures coming off of the primary ducts, whereas the magenta P95 cells and the cyan wild type cells are kind of mixed throughout the duct epithelium. By 10 weeks of age, the gland the development of the mammary gland is, is, is completed. And now you can, again, continue to see this remarkable change in morphology that is still associated with each oncogene. Uh, these bud-like structures become more apparent for the delta-16 expressing epithelial cells. Uh, you can see wild-type cells are fairly restricted uh, to the ducts. And then P95 epithelial cells are also restricted into the ducts, and you can see fairly infrequent. So the question, though, really is, well, what about tumorigenic potential? And this was really our first insight into that process. And so we really wanted to be able to um, image these fluorescent proteins. Uh, and I should say that, you know, our primary mode of imaging is confocal microscopy. And we wanted to image them. We wanted to, you know, see the overall morphology of the tumor. Uh, and we wanted to be able to do it pretty quickly. And you know, we I had shown you. I, I'll back up. These slides are, are these images are whole mount views of the t of the organ in which we clarify the organ and then image by confocal. The problem with the clarification technique and with the confocal microscope is that we can't get very deep. Uh, in, in the in the normal mammary gland, we can see uh, the majority of the epithelium because we're able to clarify it pretty well and and, and compress the tissue down. But as tu as tumors get quite large and their volumes get large and necrotic. Uh, and, and very, uh, it becomes very challenging to image these tumors. And so one thing that we've done is we, we take the tumors uh, and, and we're able to very quickly uh, embed them in auger uh, and then perform a, uh, a compressed tone thick slice. And we can take the compressed tone slice, we can immediately image, or we can take the thick slices and then clarify again over the top. And we can start to get really nice images of the tumor that look like this, where now we're able to get down this is just a kind of a lower uh, um, field, a uh, lower magnified field of view, but we can really start to see some really neat uh, insight into the tumors. Um, first and foremost, in the scan of about 25 different tumors, what we found very early was that wild type tumors were, were pretty rare, rare. Only about one out of 25 times do we see a wild type tumor. Um, whereas about 13 out of, uh, 13 times we see, in this case, uh, yellow and magenta tumors on their own. And the remaining cases tended to be mixed between the genotypes. Now, uh, the other thing we noticed is that you can even see from this kind of view of a, a thick section of the tumor, you can even see differences in their morphology, right? So you can see that the, the, the wild type tumors and delta-16 tumors are fairly uh, uniformly uh, uh, colored, whether that's by with the cyan fluorescent protein or the yellow fluorescent protein. But the uh, MKO expressing tumors, this is the P95 tumors, you can see uh, look different morphologically. Evidence of some like striations uh, are, are apparent and, and a little bit less cellularity from a fluorescence point of view. So this really gave us some insight indicating that there, there were likely not only differences in tumorigenic potential, but also uh, potentially differences in the morphology of these tumors. So we surveyed in this first publication, 52 tumors. Uh, we, we imaged, we did a multitude of imaging studies uh, from compressed tome sections and imaging all the way up to classical FFPE embedding, which is what you see here, and imaging for the fluorescent proteins. What we found in this small survey of 52 tumors was that, you know, the overwhelming number of P95 tumors fit this category of what we'd call invasive, whereas the overwhelming number of delta-16 tumors were more expansile. And you can see that in these two histological images here on the right. The two wild-type tumors that we found were very similar to the delta-16 tumors. So to kind of summarize currently, what we can say is that there are differences in tumorigenic potential for both the wild-type delta-16 and P95 isoforms, with delta-16 and P95 being much more tumorigenic than wild-type. But even within the delta-16 and P95 tumors, there are differences in morphology. So we really wanted to know what is driving uh, uh, this difference in morphology. And 
what is driving in this case, the P95 tumors to become more invasive, uh, to be uh, uh, more immune infiltrated. And also uh, you can see how they're just uh, um, much more, uh, excuse me, they're, they're just um, much more uh, aggressive looking compared to the DOT16 tumors. So we went in, uh, did some additional imaging analysis and imaging for the isoforms of, of excuse me, for our Cranbo colors. This is FFPE sections of several different tumor colors and, and tumor genotypes, wild type D16 and P95 shown here. And we imaged for multiple uh, uh, IHC markers, F480, FOXP3, PD1, CD8, pd one CD11B. So markers uh, of the immune e ecosystem. And what we could see, just like our pathology was pointing us that the, the P95 tumors appear to be more, more immune hot, we can see that here in the P95 tumors. We can also see uh, the, the infiltration of you know, T regulatory cells that are expressing uh, the immune checkpoint molecules as well. And so really there are pretty major differences in the, um, uh, the cellularity of these tumor types. From this, you might hypothesize then that there could be differences in metastatic potential. So uh, one of the things we've done in the lab is we've started to harvest lungs from our models. Um, we take the entire lung from, from the mouse, we, we clarify it, uh, and then we image for the presence of metastases like this, or even you can see single, like in this region of interest here, single disseminated tumor cells within the lung. Uh, and what we found is that there was a really uh, large increase uh, between P95 and D16 when we look at the numbers of disseminated cells, upwards of 40 disseminated cells per lung that were P95 positive, whereas DELT16 tumor cells disseminated to the lung were exceptionally rare. We also tested uh, treatment uh, sensitivity or treatment resistance by uh, dosing uh, these mice with either trastuzumab or lapatinib, we found that the DOT16 tumors were responding quite well to trastuzumab, whereas P95 tumors did not respond at all, which is what would be expected because they lack the N-terminus of, of the receptor. And we also tested the receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor lapatinib uh, because it's been suggested that in the absence of an N-terminal ectodonate, maybe, maybe the uh, uh, receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors might be uh, useful for P95, but in our hands, uh, P95 in this case actually escapes uh, um, RTK inhibition as well. So this really paints kind of a, uh, um, uh, I guess, a, a sobering picture of um, HER2 and, and its ability to um, be targeted, because if HER2 becomes this P95 isoform, our data would suggest that the tumors will become uh, more invasive, uh, they will become more metastatic and across the board in our hands, at least uh, treatment resistant. So what could we do then to treat these tumors? And where are these tumors coming from? And I think, you know, if you, as a reminder, I think what should be quite astonishing to us all is that if we look at the, the gland, the mammary gland, before we have evidence for a tumor, What's remarkable is the extent at which uh, yellow delta-16 cells and even wild type 2 cells are predominant clones within the epithelium. And so very few P95 cells actually exist within the duct. Yet, when we look a few weeks later, there are just as many P95 tumors as there are delta-16 tumors, and there's more metastases. So it really begins to cause us to raise some big questions about the extent at which, you know, proliferative advantages may actually be necessary or not for establishing these invasive tumors. And so we really wanted to get at that. And so, you know, this is most of this now is unpublished data from my lab where we wanted to really, you know, increase our data set. So I had shown you previously in that publication, we looked at 52 tumors, but now we're looking in this case, at almost 2,000 tumors. I think we're well beyond that now. Uh, and what we do is we, we take the mouse at necropsy and we image all 10 glands for, for every object that we can find in the gland, uh, down to about 50 to 100 microns in diameter. 
And so this is a mouse that is, you know, fairly young. It's about 10-ish weeks old. And you can see uh, just a few small dots that are starting to appear. So these are small tumors. Whereas if we wait longer, these tumors start to get larger. And so the, what we wanted to do then was survey how many tumors do we see for each genotype in time. And what was nice to see again is this, this nice difference between tumorigenic potential uh, between wild type D16 and P95. Again, D16 and P95 were really similarly tumorigenic. Uh, and, you know, in essence, six to tenfold more tumorigenic than wild type HER2. Now, again, it's interesting because of the extent with which you see wild type and Delta 16 fields emerging here. Interesting that we would have just as many P95 tumors in the end. So we went on kind of this uh, um, uh, fun survey of the gland, and we started euthanizing mice every three and a half days from 10 weeks of age to 20 weeks of age. And I'm showing you here three bins of 10 weeks, 15 weeks, and 20 weeks. And we really wanted to answer the, ask the question, well, could we start to look at the numbers of tumors as we compartmentalize based upon small to large? So this idea that tumors initiate at the smallest state that we're able to detect in this assay, which is about 50 to 100 microns in diameter, and then out to these larger, larger tumors that are more palpable. And we really just started counting them. Uh, and this shows you just the number of small tumors at 10 weeks, 15 weeks, and 20 weeks. And interestingly enough, despite kind of less small tumors for P95 at any given time, the P95 large tumors seem to catch up, right? And we want to know, does this mean that, you know, uh, for every small tumor that's formed, the likelihood that it progresses to the larger tumor is just much higher for P95 than it is for Delta 16. And so we started taking a lot of measurements over time. Uh, we started looking at the field sizes, those, those patches I was showing you before there were any tumors formed. We started looking at these, the smallest objects we could detect microscopically and all the way out to those large palpable lesions. And then we used uh, some mathematical modeling uh, through collaboration here at Duke and trying to fill in the hole, which is this U, this unobservable period. So what is the, what does, how many tumors do we have? What does it look like? Where are they at? Can, can we start to fill this in with a mathematical notation to help us understand the rates at which we could be going from a field to this actual detectable small cancer. And does that rate change differ between the genotypes? And so, you know, I'm just showing you a, a lot from our conclusion, you know, really just trying to conclude uh, what we've found thus far. And what we're able to show is that these Delta 16 cells have an exceptionally high proliferative advantage in the duct compared to the wild type and much more proliferative than the P95. These cells then, the yellow, yellow Delta 16 cells are models predicting they're able to form these kind of intermediate unobservable units that we're looking for now that precede the small tumors at much higher frequency. Uh, P95 forms these much more rarely, but when they form, they progress quite rapidly to this large tumor. So this begins to uh, really kind of show how, you know, um, the, the invasive potential and the growth dynamics of these larger, invasive, more metastatic tumors may actually be uncoupled from the early proliferative dynamics within the duct that Delta-16 is so good at taking advantage of. And despite having this great increased proliferative potential, the ability to making small, more small tumors, these small tumors then are kind of restricted in space to become these large proliferative masses that are actually very unlikely to metastasize. Whereas the P95 cells invade likely quite early and, and in a way in an undetectable way. So it gives us a really nice way to look at these uh, very early events in, in breast cancer. And so then we backed up and we said, well, what could be different at the cellular level between these tumor types? So we, we've been doing a significant amount of single cell RNA sequencing. We've sequenced over 100,000 cells um, across our tumor genotypes. And we are able then to um, cell annotate the different epithelial cell types. And so we can see nice groups of epithelial cells, the epcam can hear in positive. We have nice groups of, in this case, immune cells, 
fibroblasts, endothelial cells, and a population of epithelial cells at the very dead center that we, we become very interested in. Uh, one of the reasons we're interested in these cells is we found that these cells are found uh, predominantly in P95 tumors. So up to 6% of the P95 cell tumors, excuse me, up to 6% of the epithelial cells in the P95 tumors, we're currently classifying them as what we're calling bystander cells. And, and the reason we're calling the bystanders is that when we probe uh, with some either by fish or by IHC for markers of this cell type, what we can find is that uh, this probe here is in green. What we can find is that the wild, the yellow tumors do not have this cell, whereas the magenta tumors do. So the P95 tumor cells, you can see them admixed with these green bystander cells, right? And what was really incredible is that these epithelial cells, if they are derived from the tumor itself, the tumor epithelium, they should be marked or lineage labeled with our magenta fluorescent protein, and they are not, indicating that there's a subset of epithelial cells present within the invasive tumors that is actually a, a, a genetically normal or maybe a, a non-transformed epithelial cell. We're able to take uh, and do some transplantation assays of, of P95 tumor cells into a normal, into a normal gland and then we can even stain for those normal cells in green and see them again. And this is a, a compressed home slice through one of these specimens. And we can start to see these green bystander cells present within uh, the P95 tumors. And so where we're going now is we're really trying to, you know, uh, um, get at the question of what these bystander cells could be doing. And so we've been developing, you know, a whole suite of um, models to model wild type D16 and P95 tumors in a transplantation asset. And so what we've done is we've isolated from our, from our animals um, cell lines from the primary tumor that are either wild type Delta 16 or P95, and then we transplant them into FEBN mice. And when we transplant them into the FEBN line, which is congenic, that's where our, our Cranborough lines have actually all been back crossed to is FEBN, we can see uh, um, uh, tumorigenic potential fairly similar between P95 and Delta 16. Again, wild type, uh, um, fairly inefficient at driving tumors, which holds to what we've seen even in vivo. But strikingly, what was incredible is that when we performed the same experiment, but in an immune uh, a compromised scenario, a skid, uh, nod skid mouse, we can actually see that yes, all the tumor cells will eventually see to, all the tumor cells will eventually transplant and form a tumor. What was incredible is that the proliferative cells that I'd shown you before, the cyan and, and, and um, TFP wild type cells and the DOT16 cells uh, proliferate much more rapidly and actually make tumors at almost the same rates. This is despite the fact that wild type cell lines do not make tumors in the immune attack setting. And P95 takes longer, but eventually will grow. So it really shows you the differences in which these cell lines are able to proliferate, are able to grow in an immune intact system versus an immune depleted system. We're also performing an extensive amount of characterization of these cell lines uh, where we're able to um, look at uh, live cell imaging where we can watch uh, differences in motility between these cell lines in the same culture. And so if I run the video again, you, what you can see is that the uh, magenta cells are much more motile compared to the yellow and cyan cells. And we can track that here on the right. So with that, I think hopefully uh, I'd just like to take some time to acknowledge all those who have done the work. So I have a, a great team of uh, five graduate students. Uh, Josh Ginzel uh, did the majority of the tumor biology work and description of the HER2 Cranbo animals. Joe Fernandez has built the cell lines and uh, work I did not have time to discuss from Allie, Natalie, and Lisa. Uh, I also thank Joelle Sills, who takes care of all of our mouse uh, colony. Uh, we've had wonderful input from undergraduate students throughout the years and postdoctoral support for bioinformatics from Chuck Acharya. Uh, collaborators include Kim Lyerly, Eric Crosby, and Zach Hartman at Duke, uh, Larry Barrick, uh, who helped uh, uh, develop some of the Cranbo models with me many years ago, 
uh, Bruce Rogers, who's helping us with the mathematical analysis of tumor growth. Uh, we have collaborations with uh, uh, Javier Brava Codora's group, where we're using these cell lines for intravital imaging. And then uh, uh, our collaborative team at UC Davis for pathology and uh, HER2 IHC. And so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Snyder. Um, so what I wanted to do is open the floor first to our attendees. And um, please feel free to unmute yourselves um, to ask any questions. I don't see any comments or questions in chat. If you're feeling a little shy, um, uh, please feel free to also enter a comment. And we have one from Ricardo. Uh, Ricardo Pineda says, great work. Thank you so much, Dr. Snyder. Um, anybody have any questions? Um, if not, Dr. Snyder, could I ask one that's very general and broad? I know that your work also um, plays a role at the Center for Applied Therapeutics. Can you tell us a little bit about the translational component and what the next step is actually for therapy of cancer or certain types of cancer? Yeah, I think, you know, um, we're really interested in using our models to identify some of the cellular interactions that are occurring within these tumors and then try to develop, you know, new approaches, you know, uh, antibody-based approaches to targeting these interactions, to targeting uh, uh, new cell types we might identify. Uh, for instance, these bystander cells, can we, can we find a way to target these cells mm -hmm. and potentially perturb um, the microenvironment within the tumor? And so, you know, we're in a really nice space at Duke where we have, you know, wonderful collaborations uh, with many investigators who, you know, have been developing these types of approaches for many years. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, we're excited to see what the future may bring. Wonderful. Anybody else have any comments or questions? Please feel free to unmute yourself. But if not, I want to give another wonderful thanks to Dr. Snyder. Uh, it's been a pleasure hosting you. And again, um, thank you for your time. And anybody can also follow up with me personally um, at Precisionary uh, with additional questions. And our webinar, this webinar will be online too. Thank you so much. Thank you.